going to read verses uh, 17 through 27, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Uh, you can follow along on the handout or on your copy of God's Word. He was setting out on his journey. A man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these things I kept from my youth. Jesus, looking at him and loved him, said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easy, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. By the way, if you uh, think, well, I've read this account in Matthew and in Luke. You're right, because in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 30, the, the, there's the same account in Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 30. We're going to look at several things here. You'll notice on your outline, the first thing is the ignorance of the man. The first thing I would ask is, how did he show respect to Jesus? And the question is, was it real? How did he show respect? And was it real? Okay, he came and addressed him as teacher. That's good. He knelt before him. He knelt before him. All right. So he came and addressed him as teacher and knelt before him. So he paid homage to him. Um, Does someone have a Bible? Look up Isaiah 29, verse 13. If someone would look up Isaiah 58 and verse 3. And someone read from Amos chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Does showing respect to Jesus in an outward way, or respect to God in an outward way, really show the intent of a heart. Uh, someone has Isaiah 29, verse 13. Please read it. And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment stop by men. Okay, so, it looks like respect... Again, what were the positive signs of that? They draw near with what? Their mouth. Okay, their mouth. Honor with lips. Their lips, yep, yeah, there's honor. The hearts are far. Okay. Not so. Okay, so, could, that, could we say that about this man? Hold on to that thought. Second verse, Isaiah chapter 58, I think I said. Someone have that? Read it, Sam. Why have we fasted and thou dost not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and thou dost not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive far all your deliverers. Okay, so here there, there's a, a sense where they're drawing near to God by fasting. Okay, but... God says, I'm not taking that. All right, because there may be fasting, but they're, again, their actions, their actions are not towards God. Okay, so they're frustrated because it's obvious God is not even paying attention to their fasting. Last verse, now Amos chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Someone have that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Come to Bethel to transgress, to Gilgal and multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. For a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened, and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them, for so you love to do, O people of Israel, prepares the word. Okay, 
Okay, it's interesting. God says to come to Bethel. What was Bethel? That's where they set up the uh, worship away from where they were supposed to be. Yeah, the, the, when, when the kingdom split, the north and the south, okay, the northern kingdom was Israel and the southern kingdom was Judah. Okay, in Judah is Jerusalem. Okay, so to keep people from going to Jerusalem, they established two places of worship, Bethel and Gilgal. Okay, so God says, okay, you want to do that? Come to Bethel and you're sinning. All right, now look, look at what they're bringing. They're, uh, they're bringing sacrifice. Um, they're bringing uh, tithes. Okay. And, uh, and offerings. Let's stop and think about that. Each one of these, we could, we could sin by proclaiming we love God with our mouth and our lips. We could even be fasting. We could even be bringing sacrifices, tithes, and offerings. And we're not hitting the mark. What's wrong with that picture? Why are those not accepted? With the heart or motives? Yeah, motives and heart. Exactly. Yeah. And we put in the words of Moses in Deuteronomy, and their hearts weren't circumcised. Yeah. Just outwardly they were circumcised. Okay. Well, let's apply that to the man. He's got the outward signs that he, he shows respect to Jesus, right? He kneels down. He shows respect in his title to the Lord Jesus Christ, calls him good master, good teacher. All right? So was it real? I would say one, one evidence, and I'm not sure exactly what one evidence it is real. He comes to Jesus. He says he has done all these things, but he still realizes he lacks something because he's asking what man, just acknowledging that Jesus knows what that is. Um, he, he realizes he lacks something. Okay. Well, he said that could be true, but he yeah, didn't realize, realize the price was too high. Yeah, right? Okay, what are you saying is that? He loved his money more. He loved his money more? When okay. the space fell, when he heard what he had to do, oh, uh, uh, no. Yeah. He could have been very much accustomed to getting his own way at any time because he had the money. Could have been. I don't know. Let's look at uh, how is his real ignorance of pride uh, or pride, ignorance or pride demonstrated? By saying he's followed all these things from the time he was. Or let's back up. What, is, what was his question? What must I do? Ah, his pride. What must I do? Interesting. And this is isn't it interesting. Uh, I'm doing something to inherit. <laughs> Who's in charge of inheritance? The person who has the who has the uh, whatever you want in the inheritance. Resources. Yeah, that has the resources. Right. Okay. So the man says, "What must I do to inherit? Let I me mean, get me on this list of an eternal life." How can I get there? So basically it's his pride, or really it's the ignorance of what eternal life is all about. So how do you demonstrate ignorance to the law? It's all outward yeah. to him. You know? Yeah. I mean, he, he probably never murdered someone, actually, with a knife or something. Yeah. Um, but Jesus would say, "Did you have you hated your brother in your heart? Right. And he probably has. <laughs> yeah, it seems like he has a pharisaical understanding of the law. Like, right. they all thought, it's just this external, like, just do, do, do. And it has nothing to do with the heart. Do, do, do. <laughs> and, and Jesus came and explained to us that it's all about the heart. Yeah. And so he obviously missed that. Right. Yeah. Right. So um, just let's just back up and ask the question. What are the three uses of the law, Josh? you remember those? Um. To show us our sin, to okay. set uh, a boundary for how we ought to live in this society, and uh, 
to be a target to what we should work towards? I forget the, the terms that we've taught it as. You got the concept. You got the concept, That's right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the first use of the law is to show us our in, incapability, okay, or the fact that we cannot plead, we cannot on our own please God. Okay, we call we come short. The law shows us how far short we are. Okay. Secondly, it is a boundary. Okay, when people are living within the bounds of the law, it's a safety net, right? It's a safety net of how to live. And, uh, you know, uh, it's a fence around to say we can live within this and it's, and it's good for us. Okay? And the last is, we would say in our heart of hearts, how can we please God? We take the law and understand every time we keep the law, every time you have the opportunity and you don't commit adultery, you're pleasing God. Every time you have the opportunity to lie and you tell the truth, you please God. Okay? Every time that you uh, keep the Lord's day, Keep made it make it holy. You are pleasing God. There's not a you don't have to wonder. Wonder if He's pleased with this. No, He is. That's why He gave us that. So that's the three uses of the law. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter four verse ten and Deuteronomy seventeen verse nineteen. Let's read those and rejoice in the fact that God has given us His word that we might know how to live. Deuteronomy four ten and seventeen nineteen. Someone have 410. Read aloud, please. How on that day, or sorry, how on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Oreg, the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words, so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children so. Okay, so when the law is read, it's to teach us to fear God because. We understand how far short we fall. Okay? Also in Deuteronomy 17 and verse 19. Anybody have that? And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life. And he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and good. Okay? So God has given us the law that, that first of all, we learn to, re to, to fear him. Learn the importance of uh, his standard for holiness. All right, the question I have is, how does the man's answer, because he said, these things I have kept uh, from my youth, how does his answer compare with Paul in Philippians 3, 4, and 6? Would somebody read Philippians 3, 4, and 6? Just to get that on our minds. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 and 6. You know, I, I, I uh, discipled this guy. I don't know if you call it disciple. It's kind of evangelistic discipleship. One of my friends. And uh, uh, he, first thing he does is go to the table of contents in his Bible. And then he writes down the scripture. And then he writes down the page <laughs> when he gets there. <laughs> Always wonder. Uh, <laughs> he's learning to. He's learning to go through the Bible. That's an interesting thing. But the sad part about it is he's in a church that doesn't crack open a Bible. So that's a sad case. Anyway. I've got a Bible that has little things on it. The tabs? Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. I think it was my grandfather's Bible. When you look at it, it's got a little black thing with a little gold. Yeah. All right, Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Who has that? <laughs> Sam's still looking for it. I know it. Blair, do you have it? I do. Read it. Read on, Blair. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. A 
Okay, let's just let's compare um, Paul and Richie. Richie, Richie, Rich. Richie, Rich. The attitude of Richie is alive and well in today's society. His attitude basically in today's church. Because he well, he says, I've like, done all these side, you know, I'm good to go. Is that Christ was not necessary. Christ's sacrifice okay. was not necessary. They got they're, they're good enough to they, they, they were hit the mark. Okay. So his attitude is I'm good. Right? I'm hitting the mark. Alright? Whereas the attitude of Paul is what? Well, in verse 7, he says, I, anything I have, uh, you know, anything, everything I have, I consider nothing. He, he considers everything that those guys are thinking uh, it makes Christ irrelevant. Paul is saying it's all rubbish. Right. Because that. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 is about the, the, the circumcisers, the, the Judaizers came to Philippi and, and it's interesting in chapter 3 verse 2 he calls them the dogs. Okay, that they're, they're pushing this legalism on the church and he says, you want to follow those guys? According to them, according to their standards, he says, I've got them topped. According to their standards. That's what he's talking about in Philippians 3. And so, but then verse 7 is very important because then he says, that's all rubbish. It's a very crude term that he uses too. So, okay, so that's all rubbish, keeping the law according to the standards of the, the Judaizer circumcision party. Okay, so here we have Paul who look at this and say, without Christ, I have nothing. Okay, the rich young, Richie Rich over here, he... I don't need Christ. Look it up. I'm good enough. Okay. Um, the question is, how does his answer demonstrate his self-ignorance of his sinful heart? And this is where we're talking about it's, the attitude is everywhere, and it is an ignorance of the heart. Some, is it an ignorance on, um, is it a self-ignorance? I just want to turn away from it, or what? Maybe they just need the Word of God to, and then we need the Spirit of God to open up the ignorance. But how is his answer a demonstration of his self-ignorance? When he says what? I'm good. I've done all these things. Really? I guess he could have been pressed. Jesus could have pressed him like uh, in the Sermon on the Mount when he goes through the different aspects of the law and says, You're, you know, let's really look at whether you're keeping the law. All right, I've got several scriptures here. Uh, Nick, would you look up Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10? Blair, would you look up Psalm 139, 1 through 4? Dave, would you look up Hebrews 4, 12 and 13? Sam, would you look up 1 John 1, 8 through 10? And Josh, would you look up Psalm 19, 7 through 13? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Okay, the heart is deceitful. The heart is deceitful in us to make us think that we're better than we are. And that was very deceitful there. And as the Lord who displays that, and that's what Jesus was doing, he was prying open the heart when he asked this man these questions and pointed out to him. All right. Blair, Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4. Hear the word of God. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know me when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far. You search, search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh, Lord, you know it all together. Is that a humbling passage of Scripture or what? God knows everything about us. He knows our words before we speak them, our actions before we do them. And the real, the real kicker on that is the fact that God still loves us. Yeah. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, Dave. For the word of 
God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing in the division of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are open and laid bare with the eyes of him whom we have to do. It's interesting. I want you to take note of that scripture because um, the scripture points to the scriptures as God's word, and we would think of it as an object. But you'll notice that last verse that Dave read is that no creature is hidden from his sight. It's like the word of God is God speaking to us. So God is making known in the Word of God that He knows all about us. And it is Him, to Him, we will have to give an account of our lives. Interesting. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. Sam? If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make no liar, and his word is not in us. Okay. Very good. So the man was basically saying he had not sinned, so he needed some cleansing from the word of God. And Josh has Psalm 19, verses 7 through 13. The law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true, and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the things of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant in keeping them, there is greater reward. Okay, so I want, you to point, I want to point out that fact that um, our hearts are deceitful above all things. And we have a tendency to hide our sin. But God, through His Word and the preaching of His Word and reading of His Word, exposes sin in our lives. We are to confess it. We just go through life and say, if we don't have sin, we lie. The man came to the Lord Jesus Christ on the outward signs of showing deep respect to Jesus, calling a good master, a good teacher. Okay, what must I do to inherit eternal life? When he heard about the law, which Jesus pointed out aspects of the law that deal with others, he said, I'm blameless, basically. I've kept all those in my youth. And, all right, so the very fact that he was ignorant of his own heart, he was denying it, his own heart. We have a tendency to do that too. We all want to just feel like we're all right. Okay? And that's what the man was doing. Second point we have on your outline there, that the love of Christ towards sinners. This is a hard thing for us to comprehend, especially when we've come to the Reformed faith, is that we have sure enough sinners out here, and we, we uh, go to Romans chapter 9 and says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Uh, we see in uh, Psalm 7, verse 11, that the Lord feels indignation every day toward the, the evil people, the evil ones, or the, um, toward the, he's the righteous judge, and he has, uh, or as one scripture says, he hates the wicked every day. So sometimes we get in that and say, well, God hates sinners, and, and, uh, uh, so then we come to a place like this, and it says that Jesus loved him. Okay, now we would run with that and say if he loved him, uh, then we must say that maybe he's one of the elect. Okay, well, we don't know what happened to the man down the road, whether he did come to Christ or not. But at this point, we have to look at the Lord Jesus Christ and say, he seems to be giving him the free offer of the gospel, and he's turning away from it. And Jesus even makes it known that it is difficult for those who are rich to come into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And by the way, that's not the place in Jerusalem that's called the needle. Okay? And there is no such place. One, one. Number two, 
Jesus pointed out something that was so ridiculous that uh, that that you could, it could never happen. A camel going through the eye of a needle. All right. That's why he says, as ridiculous as that is a rich man coming into the kingdom. It takes the power of God. So, how do we put it together? Let's read Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 through 39. Love Christ for sinners. Read that, Matthew 23, 37 through 39. You have that? Yeah. All right. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen, gathers a brood on her wings, and you were not willing to see your houses left you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And sometimes we have a hard time grasping something, and God shows us here through the words of our Lord Jesus Christ that He wept over Jerusalem. He cared about these people, these people. And yet these are the people that are going to turn on Him. And these are the people that are going to suffer through the desolation of the uh, coming armies into Jerusalem in 70 AD. So He's care, He cares enough about them, and He actually... He's weeping over them when he's doing this. Did he love them? Would you say he loved them? Obviously he does. He cared about them, right? Did he love them in the same way that he loves his elect? No. It's not God's will that any should perish. He is holy. He's holy. Okay. There's a scripture I want you to, to read of God's sovereignty and His grace in Ezekiel 18 and verse 32. This is one of those you might want to underline in your Bible because it is an important text. Ezekiel 18 and verse 32. God is pronouncing judgment and calling on repentance. And He's talking about what He's going to be doing to people that do not take heed to His word. And then He says this. Ezekiel 18 and verse 32. He says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord, the Lord God. So turn and live. <laughs> Sounds like a free offer of the gospel, doesn't it? Sounds like, you know, sometimes we decide who dis who's going to be a good candidate for the gospel. <laughs> so we might look at this rich young ruler or young man and feel like, ah, I just wasn't one of the elect. He went away sad. Okay? Uh, Jesus had compassion on sharing the gospel. When was the last time you saw a judge sentence someone to death and like, ha, ha, ha. Yes. It's so fun. And yeah. that's not how it, where it's a somber thing. It's a very somber thing. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So we have to understand, um, I like what we were talking about this yesterday in our leadership training about, um, uh, I think some you mentioned Martin Lloyd-Jones or somebody. But the quote is, Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, said that preachers should be accused of being Arminians by presenting the free offer of the gospel in such terms to call people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Martin Lloyd-Jones, if you ever heard him, he, he believed in the sovereign grace of God. But he would call sinners to repentance. He would call people to to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So, uh, that's the free offer of the gospel, but why do men turn from the gospel? Turn to John chapter 3 and verse 19, and John chapter 5 and verses 40 through 42. 3, 19 and 5, 40 and 42. John chapter 3 and verse 19. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And that's, that's what people are. They love the darkness. And so they need the quickening work of the Holy Spirit to give them a desire 
for God. To open their ears so they can hear. And open their hearts so they believe. And of course, open their minds so they understand. John chapter 5 and verse 40 says, You refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from my people, from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. That's the difference. The difference is God's sovereign love within us makes the difference. And so the man, we would look at this man and say, okay, did Jesus care enough about him to confront him about his real heart condition? Okay. By asking him, did he keep the law? And he said, oh yeah. And he gave the example that you know, he kept the law even from his youth. And Jesus pointed out to him, well, he lacked one thing. What is the one thing, by the way? Remember the, uh, what was the movie, City Slickers? <laughs> one thing. Cur I think Cur was it Curly? It said yeah. yeah. Okay, so, one thing. What, what was the one thing he lacked? Follow Jesus. I mean, what, it would be evident to follow Jesus. So would you, how would you point that to a scripture? A very important scripture. It would be the one thing. Well, I, I don't know if this is what you're getting at, but, but Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one. Yeah. He is the one thing that he's lacking. I'll, I'll buy that. I'm looking for, some, answer, I don't looking for something that you would probably say was... Uh, Man came and said, What's the greatest commandment? What is the greatest commandment, Josh? Wait a minute. Let's back up two steps. What is the greatest commandment? To love your love the Lord your God with what? All your heart. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. All in, as Heath likes to say. You're all in. Okay, here he says you lack one thing. He's not all in, is he? God is not the most important person in his life. He is. That brings us to the third point. The danger of the love of money. What is the root of man's problem? I just told you. He loves his money. He loves his money. He loves comfort. Yeah, he loves comfort. He loves the pleasures. Okay? loves wealth, and, he loves, and because of that, he's full of self-righteousness. Again, I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that he had enough money to get his way anytime, anywhere. Okay? Sometimes these uh, professional athletes get to feel like they're above the law because they get their own way anytime, anywhere, because they have so much money. They just, I think I might have told him one time, a friend of mine that I interviewed uh, when I was on radio was a high school basketball coach and he was friends with one of the top NBA players and he said that uh, they went out, were going out to eat one night and the player said just a minute I need to cash my paycheck this weekly paycheck okay and he cashed it, can you believe he cashed it, for $77,000 that was his weekly paycheck so the man wanted a pocket full of money so he had a pocket full of $77,000 and this high school basketball coach said he knew that because the man came out and his wallet was just bursting at the seams and he pointed out, here's my paycheck, $77,000. Okay, now, <clears throat> not too wise to do that, <clears throat> but you and I have no concept of what these guys make. And so when you see that, you know, this is years ago too, so seventy-seven thousand dollars is a weekly paycheck. I just, I just, I can't even think fathom that. Uh, we can't. But when a man, when a man goes from living in poverty growing up to a paycheck of seventy-seven thousand dollars, knowing he, next week he's going to get another one, no wonder they go out and blow it, and they feel like they can buy their way into anything. So it is it seems to be in our society. Yeah, LeBron James makes. I just did the math. $105,000 a day for the next four years. Really? You just did the math? <laughs> yeah. yeah he, he has a contract, $154 million contract for four years. It's insane. Wow. Sorry, rabbit trail. <laughs> well, it's interesting to me. 
With that said, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, then Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, and then John chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. The danger of the love of money. This man went away. He went away sad. His countenance was down because he loved his money more than God with everything, all that he had, right? So here's an example of what happens. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and verse 10. Someone read that, please. Who has it? The love of money is the root of all evils. It is the root of the craving. And some have wandered away from the faith and pierced, and pierced their hearts with many hands. So how would you describe the person that loved? This is a person that probably was in the church because they, they, they wandered away from the faith. So maybe they never had it. We don't know. But okay, well, regardless, of, they're just an unrepentant sin or whatever. Notice it says they, they pierce their heart with many pangs, hurts. I've heard it uh, described as uh, uh, like a pig on a spit, just turning, being slowly roasted in its own way. <laughs> <laughs> roasted alive. Oh, yeah. that's, boy, that's a good graphic illustration. <laughs> All right. All right, so Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, the parable of the soils that Jesus taught, and one of the soils was the seed sown among thorns. And how does that read, Heath? This is the one who hears the word, the cares of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Whoa. Okay, think about it. Cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke it out. Alright, so you're not being fruitful in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the other hand, John 15, verses 1 and 2. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. How would you apply that to a member of the church that is all of a sudden seeking after wealth rather than the things of God? Well, it would depend if they're... If what you're saying is they're loving their wealth, um, you know, and it's a, a sinful form of that. Um, you would you would warn them with the, this passage, and right? Say simply because you're a professor doesn't mean that you actually possess the faith that you profess. Right, and the, the good part about it is, if something happened in their lives that God is pruning them to get their attention, it's a good thing, right? Because God's promised to prune us. So when we get off the track. The Lord doesn't leave us. All right. Consider the words of Jesus back in the text, Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 10, verses 23 through 27. Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. So how can we have uh, a focus on money or wealth or ease, and uh, that can keep us from being totally sold out, and how can we live with those things, or live without those things, and still please God? The answer is in Philippians 4, 8, 11, and 1 Timothy 6, and verse 6. And on these we'll close this morning. Philippians 4, verse 11. Not that I'm speaking in, in need, of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. We learn contentment where we are. Paul says, I've learned to abound, I've learned to be abased, I've learned to have and not to have. Secondly, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. Oh, to pray that on a daily basis that God would help us to be content with our state of life, content with Him, and to seek after godliness. Any other word? It's a beautiful account here that Lord Jesus Christ still knowing all things about this man before he ever talked to him, still presented the gospel to him, didn't he? 
call him to repent of his ways and follow him. God is the gracious God. 